This is North Dakota Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest in the program today is the governor of North Dakota, Governor Doug Burgum. Thank you for being here. Great to be here, Dave. Uh, so how was your first legislative session, your impressions? Well, it was an exciting time, of course, when Brent Sanford and I took office on December 15th. We uh, were inheriting uh, over 5,000 people camping Ill legally on federal land in North Dakota. And, uh, and that was a, had you know, evolved into something very different from whence it had begun and had become almost a global spectacle in terms of the, uh, the social online media, the funding that was there. And so that was a, uh, really in a crisis management, emergency management situation that we, we jumped into. And it was 76 days after we took office when the last person uh, left uh, the protest camps. And then we had 21 million pounds of debris uh, to clean up. Uh, and so that was, a, you know, a, a <clears throat> when I think about the beginning of the legislature, my first legislative session, that's something that will, uh, was that coincided with that that took a, took a tremendous amount of attention. But with the successful uh, completion of that, successful and peaceful resolution, uh, the, the first session uh, also happened to be, for the legislators, a monumental task. The legislators were uh, arriving to have to figure out a way uh, to what turned out to be $1.7 billion of reduction out of a $6 billion general fund. And that was a task never, no legislature had ever uh, had to tackle. And from a percentage term, it was really, you have to go back to the, to the 1930s, the Great Depression, where people had taken that kind of a percentage term out. So I would just say, <clears throat> you know, kudos to the legislature because of the, uh, you know, they came to town with an idea that we had to reduce the size of government. Uh, and a lot of teamwork, a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice made in a lot of fronts, but we, uh, you know, ended up uh, getting getting the job done. So you think the product coming out of the session just overall is a good product then? Well, I think the, the, I think the thing that everybody in the legislature can feel really great about is that with that kind of reduction, but still preserving the legacy, the principal and the legacy fund, uh, which is about the, you know, the future legacy of our you know, that's, you know, kids and grandchildren, the children, that's not, I don't think of that as the legislator's money. I don't think of it, it's the state's money. I think of that as the taxpayer's money and future generations taxpayer money. So to be able to preserve that, that principle uh, was significant. And then the, the other piece that people can feel great about is that we actually increased funding for K through 12 during this period, over $150 million increase in K through 12 funding uh, to be able to get that done at a time when we were when we were uh, cutting budgets so substantially, I think again is uh, uh, you know bode, bodes well for our future. And of course, part of that was the legislature setting up, and the, and the people in North Dakota approving that special K twelve fund, where where you could dive into it to, in case you needed to kind of shore up uh, K twelve funding. Yeah, the, yeah. They have the foresight back in the late nineteen eighties to create a what's called the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, but really it's a rainy day fund for higher ed. Or, or, or excuse me, for K through 12, a rainy day fund for uh, for K through 12. It was utilized last year uh, when we had the uh, first Governor Dalrymple's allotments or budget cuts, followed by the special session, which was there's more cutting to meet the you know try to catch up with the falling revenue, and it really came into play this time because it allowed uh, K through 12 to actually increase their funding. Uh, at the same time, because uh, they've got their own special rainy day fund, allow them to increase their funding at a time when uh, the rest of the budgets were falling. Yeah, at a time when um, oil prices were down and agriculture was down, there were two allotments your predecessor had mm -hmm. to do, and then had to dive into some of these, these trust funds and had to drain a couple of trust funds. Going ahead, is the, was that the wise decision, and uh, do you think that things will start coming back? Well, I, there are two questions there, and one is, uh, I think that we had enough money tucked away to get through what would have been a, uh, even more of a f fiscal crisis. Uh, but we have now drained, we've drained really everything. We've drained, we've drained the budget stabilization fund. We drained the, what was a huge beginning balance. Uh, and, and we've drained lots of smaller funds. And so when, we're, when we head into this, uh, this next biennium, we're operating with a much tighter uh, available variance that we have relative to our performance because with a small beginning balance and a very, very small uh, budget stabilization, basically no budget stabilization fund, it'll fill up a little bit during the thing. We're, we are in a, 
uh, thing where we've, you know, we have to perform. So of course, we've all got our fingers crossed. We all believe we've budgeted conservatively. Uh, and we all, of course, are hoping that the economy will come back. Uh, and if it doesn't, we've got, a, we've got a budget that we can operate from. But uh, if it doesn't come back uh, the next time, two years from now, there'll even be more work to do because some of the funding that we achieved in this $4.3 billion general fund came from one-time sources, not from, from, from ongoing sources. And so in, unless, if we, if, unless we have a recovery in the economy, uh, we're going to have, it'll be another uh, set of hard work for us when we get back here in two years. When I started covering the legislative sessions back in the late 1970s, there was always talk about what the ending fund balance was going to be. Do you know offhand what the projected ending fund balance is going to be? Uh, it's $50 million. And, and of course, that maybe seems like a large, uh, large number, uh, but when we're talking about you know operating a, a state government on over uh, the the whole budget with the federal funds, matching funds, and other funds coming in, the whole budget is over uh, 13 billion dollars for two years. So that means it's over six billion for for one year, which means it's over 50. Uh, it's over it's over uh, 500 million a month. And so, when you've got fifty million dollars in your uh, in your en in your ending balance to play with, as sort of slack, that's kind of I think of that as one tenth of a month. And so, if like if it was a family was trying to operate uh, in their in their checking account on one tenth of a month's uh, cushion, that's in some ways what we're up against. Yeah, you're talking three days, perhaps if you yeah. average thirty days a yes. month. Yeah, it's a, it's so a, it's saying. A I mean, we really. We, we had a big safety net that got us through this, this uh, revenue shortfall. That safety net's gone, and now, now we're going to have to operate things. Uh, we've got to be very, very, very cautious about how we operate. How confident are you that the economy is coming back or will, will come back? Well, I, I think uh, you know, there's a number of things that are beyond our control, which is, includes the global price for commodities for agriculture and oil. The things that are in our control and the things that North Dakotans do very well at is applying ingenuity, ingenuity innovation uh, to, uh, to problems to try to solve them. And in this case, the problem, the problem in North Dakota, how do, you, how do you grow more crops with, uh, for less dollars and how do you produce more energy uh, for less dollars? And we've seen uh, the break-even point. I mean, we had, you know, during the height of the, height of the oil boom, you know, oil companies might have needed $70 a barrel to make money, and now we've got companies that are making money at 50 because they've worked hard. They've lowered the number of days it takes to drill a well. They've increased increased their uh, output. Uh, they're <clears throat> they've been more efficient in terms of of land use because we've got m many more wells on a single pad, which is good for surface owners. So a lot of innovation that's occurring that's uh, allowing. That's and I think that's why we're seeing a even at $50 a barrel oil, we're seeing a pickup in activity. Uh, in the uh, in the oil country in North Dakota, and that's a, that's a good good thing for all the taxpayers in the state. Yet there there are still some sales tax implications on that too. Have you taken a look at that? And is there going to be some adjustments to how revenue forecasting is done? Uh, again, there's two questions there. One is there was a real departure uh, for a number of years during the boom. There was a, a correlation between uh, wells drilled and sales tax, and that. That relationship uh, has departed. It's pretty dramatic on a chart. Where now, uh, even as uh, you know, wells drilled returns starts to return back to uh, previous numbers. We're not seeing the sales tax accompaniment. So that's some of the efficiencies we talked about about earlier. And so the the <clears throat> we we have to in our forecasting models take that into account and say that hey, relationships that existed before may not exist uh, going forward. And there is work to be done. Uh, to help us make sure we can do a better job of forecasting uh, going uh, forward. But I think the important, the important principle there is that we have one forecast uh, that the executive branch and legislators all work on together to make the one very best forecast, keep politics out of it, and really have it be driven by the, uh, the best uh, econometric data that we can put together, and then use that to uh, guide our spending decisions in the future. And that's why you used the line item veto in that one bill. I did. Uh, you know, I, I share... The, I share the, uh, the, the understanding, the need, and the aspiration for us to do a better job of forecasting, but I'd like to have an opportunity to work with the legislature on the existing revenue forecasting advisory board we have now and the existing approaches we have now, because uh, uh, it, it will be, uh, we'll be well served with better forecasting. We won't be well served with two competing forecasts.
Yeah, and it is the governor's job to present an executive budget. It's the legislature's job to to massage it and to, to pass bills or, or to reject ideas. Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of the, the veto pen, I believe that the figures that I saw, you had done some line item vetoing in about 10 bills, and there were three bills that were vetoed completely, correct? That's correct. And uh, was there any kind of recurring theme why you vetoed these things? Well, I think uh, if you look across the body of the, the vetoes, there was a theme that would say, let's make sure we uh, have a, a clear understanding of the role of the legislature versus the role of the executive branch. And this is not a, it's not a new thing. I mean, since the, our country got started with three separate branches of, of uh, government, uh, and certainly since uh, 1889 when North Dakota started, I'm sure there's been a, a, a push and a pull between the legislature and the executive branch every time they've met about uh, where those uh, responsibilities uh, reside and where they might might collide. And I think it's a, um, it's a, it's a terrific discussion for us to always be having because if we're pressing on uh, each other's duties, that probably means there's no gaps in between as opposed to us being so far apart that things were, would fall in the cracks. But, uh, you know, overall, from a legislative standpoint, we, you know, I signed, had an opportunity to sign over 400 bills with no changes, signed over 40 appropriations bills with no changes. And you think about doing that at a time when we're taking this much cutting out. So, again, I would just say, uh, you know, high marks to the to the, the legislature. And if you take the 13 bills out of the uh, the, the total amount, we're talking about a couple of percent. So 95, 97% of the time we were in complete agreement, had some fine tuning at the end, but all in all, in all I think a great session. There was, the, of course, the, the bill, and you knew I was gonna bring this up, was the Public Employees <laughs> Retirement System bill, which you vetoed a lot of that bill mm -hmm. and left kind of the funding intact. Is, is that a fair statement? Well, I think the uh, the, the parts that I vetoed had, had didn't really have anything to do with the funding, so we weren't messing around with the funding or the health insurance of, uh, uh, with the state employees or the retirement system. So I want to make sure that was uh, uh, that we're making no changes there. But there was some suggested language in the bill about creating a brand entirely brand new legislative committee on top of the existing 13-person uh, legislative committee, which already reviews employee benefits, and then the entire public uh, employees retirement board, the PERS board, as it's called, which has two legislators. So we had two boards that are managing this area. We're going to create a third one. And uh, again, I, I share the aspiration for bringing our health care costs under control uh, that the legislature had, but I had a, a different view on uh, the best way to uh, approach this. And so, you know, look forward to working through the existing structure we have with the legislators on the employee benefit, with uh, the PERS board, uh, to make sure we're doing everything we can to try to... Uh, uh, deliver a great competitive employee benefits so we can attract great people to state government, but at the same time making sure that we're doing that in a way we're being good fiduciaries of uh, state taxpayer dollars. So we're clear then you're, you're not opposed to, going, to looking at uh, what they call a self-funded insurance plan. No, I, I think there's a, you know, we've got, we have a hybrid approach today, but whether it's a completely self-funded, a hybrid plan, uh, or you know a full insurance uh, program. I think we have to look across the spectrum of that. But whenever a company goes to self-funded, you're also if you get lower rates through self-funding, that means that you've got the capital to take on more risk yourself because you're not pooling that risk with with the company that you're buying the insurance from. And at a point, as we talked earlier about uh, all of our balances being so low. Uh, you know, if we were, you know, sitting on, you know, billions of dollars of free cash, then you might say, hey, great time to self-insure. But I think part of it is not just the idea of self-insurance, but when, when do we have, make sure we've got the financial capacity to not have an unexpected, uh, unexpected cost? Because when you're self-insuring, you're, you, you might have lower rates, but you've got higher risk. Those two things, you can't get lower rates without higher risk. And this is a way to, to uh, reduce some risk at a time when we've got really thin balances. This sounds like something above my pay grade in talking about that, but you seem to know a lot about that. Well, it, it's a, uh, you know, in, in the private sector, uh, it, the whole last 20 years, the way people compete for employees is part with salary, part with benefits, part with vacation, part with the work culture, but part of the way you compete for talent is with your benefits package. So anybody that's, uh, you know, been a CEO in a private sector has spent a lot of time uh, understanding the costs and trade-offs of, of employee-related 
healthcare packages, and this is no no different than that in the past. And like I said, in, in there are certainly cases where self insurance can lead to lower rates, but it does it does uh, it does mean more risk more risk for whoever's taking on that that self insuring. Let me ask you this because it, it stems from your discussion about this about it, benefits being one part of attracting people. Uh, is there any concern from you or from your cabinet that when the economy improves and we see more jobs being open in North Dakota because we've just gone through a bunch of cutting, does that make it harder to attract people saying, are we really sure that the jobs are going to be there? Well, I think it's a, the whole part of workforce development, workforce recruiting is an issue for the whole state. And we have 15,000 jobs open and I think sometimes and very low unemployment. So then we say to ourselves, "Hey, you know, we're a great, you know, we're a great state because we've got uh, low unemployment and all these available jobs. Every job that is posted in the private sector that's unfilled, that's a lost opportunity. That person could be, uh, you know, paying sales tax, buying a home, buying a car, sending their kids to school, uh, participating in some way. And so, you know, when I think when I look at those fifteen thousand jobs, I say, "Wow, if we could fill those tomorrow, that'd be like adding." another Jamestown uh, to our state overnight. I mean, think of the economic impact if we could add another, uh, you know, community that would be among our top 10 largest communities. So when we're in this basic chronic workforce scarcity situation as a state, then we have to think about it more holistically. It's not just the benefits package, but it's also what, what we're in our, you know, our universities producing the graduates we need. Uh, answer is not enough of them to fill those all those jobs, especially in the high skilled ones. The really, you know, the technical jobs, petroleum engineering, nursing. We're a thousand nurses short in our state, so we we have to produce more supply uh, through education system. But in the meantime, we got to close that gap by recruiting. We have to have net in migration. We have to get people who graduate, uh, you know, from South Dakota State to want to come to. Uh, come get a job in North Dakota or the, you know, South Dakota School of Mines to come up here and get a job in the Bakken or pick Montana, pick anywhere in the country. We got to get people to move here. And, and the way uh, people are making decisions on where to live, they make that decision about is the community vibrant, uh, you know, parks and recreation. I mean, it, yes, it's about their, their health care package and their benefits, but it's the whole thing. And so it, it, this is why we talk about the Main Street Initiative is really about trying to solve the our chronic workforce shortage problem by making sure that we've got vibrant communities that young people and families want to move to and that the retiring baby boomers in North Dakota want to stay in as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, if we can get them to stay and work here till they're 65 as opposed to leave them when they're 55, that'll also help our workforce issue. Besides the Main Street Initiative, you were talking about reinventing government and the legislature wasn't real keen on that this time, but is there something that you're hoping to do by next session to do something with a reinventing government and also with Main Street? Well, I actually think that in, with one of the other reasons why this was a, uh, I'm you know, very positive about the whole session and, and uh, the, the, uh, the very, uh, like I said, monumental job that the legislation, legislature got done was in the middle of, of all the challenges that we faced fiscally, there was several areas of significant reinvention that occurred. The biggest one that comes to mind is in the justice reinvention. And of course, this is something that, that uh, legislators and the judicial branch, the attorney general, uh, people have been working on this for many sessions, but in some ways it was a bit of a breakthrough to come through. And it was, uh, you know, terrific to, you know, to be able to uh, uh, stand alongside at a press conference with the with the chief justice, with the attorney general, uh, Leanne Birch, the head of corrections, uh, a, a bevy of uh, senators and representatives, all who've poured time and energy into this because, you know, we're, we're in a point where as a society, we have a big opportunity to really stop doing things that, that haven't worked and, and start heading in a direction where they do work. And when I think about really, when you think about 30 or 40 years of war on drugs, if you think about, you know, that whole mentality in the national level, if you have a war on drugs, well then the person who's uh, using the drugs is really a enemy combatant. You know, that's the, the word, the language of that is that we're at war. And so we're basically at war at people who have a health issue and that health issue is addiction. And we have to start treating addiction like the chronic disease it is because, in, you know, arresting and imprisoning someone with an addiction doesn't cure the addiction. Turning that person into a felon, uh, then when they, when they are released, they have 
very few places to live, often can't find a job, and we've also added the generational challenge that we've broken up that family because they're probably a mother or a father with kids. Uh, we could be passing on those issues to the next generation. So we take on a, a huge amount of social cost when we make that decision. And we know that we can incarcerate someone for $41,000 a year. We know we can treat them for addiction for much less than that. And so by moving $7 million upstream out of corrections and towards this effort, small amount of dollars, $7 million, but a huge philosophical change. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm excited about where we can go. I mean, I think as a state, we can maybe take the lead in this. And it could be, this is going to be an ongoing effort for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been exciting to see the First Lady, uh, you know, Catherine Helgus Burgum, really step out in a courageous way and say, hey, we've got to uh, understand, we have to get beyond the, the stigma of addiction uh, and really talk about what we can do as a state because this is touching, this is not restricted by income or geography. This touches, you know, every part of the state. It touches all of our tribal lands. It touches low income, high com income, it touches ur urban and rural areas, and there's a very, very high cost to addiction, and the only way we're gonna solve that is is uh, working together. So you're thinking, you know, maybe two years from now, you might have some more proposals on behavioral health, and especially community-based behavioral health. Well, I, I think that we, there, Certainly we will, and we'll certainly keep moving down the path that we've started. But in the meantime, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we have to do because we've got, you know, area geography, particularly the western half of the state, very short of behavioral health professionals. We, there were some changes in legislation this year that helped maybe loosen it up around the edges, but there's work that we still have to do. And then in terms of uh, understanding the role of peer-to-peer -peer counseling can be very effective. And so, you know, how do, how do we bring community-based or peer-to-peer -peer counseling in to help people, you know, who are, who are in recovery to stay in recovery? Were there any disappointments out of this session? Well, I, I think uh, uh, I'd take, take another highlight before we go to disappointments. Sure. Another good piece of uh, exciting uh, legislation is the, the innovation bill in K through 12, because uh, really the principle of lo local control, letting local school districts work with the you know innovative principals, superintendents, and teachers that want to unleash uh, new technologies, new approaches for hands-on uh, learning, for uh, actual uh, you know, real life situation learning uh, for the, th so that kids can learn the skills that they need to be successful in the 21st century economy. I think that that is, uh, v you know, very exciting. And I, and I know that a year from now, if we're back here, we're going to have lots of examples to, uh, to hear from uh, school districts and schools, whether elementary, junior high, high school, that are doing very innovative things that are going to be more engaging for students and, and helping really help kids uh, have the skills they need to be successful. I know you, that, that you recently gave an award to a Bismarck school yes. for, for some innovation. Yeah, uh, Simley uh, Junior High uh, had a chance. They were, they were uh, named one of a national Samsung uh, award winner, the $25,000 scholarship. But meeting with these junior high kids, they were, they were working on a project uh, that they got to choose. And what they ended up working on was a solar-powered uh, cell phone char charger uh, that homeless people could use, uh, in a, say, in a park. Well, to come to that conclusion, they've got to understand physics on, of, of solar. They, got, they talk to city commissioners to understand, yes, there actually is homeless issues, that homeless people do have smartphones. Uh, they, they do have a, a real social problem of where, you know, where do I go to plug in a phone at night if I don't have a place to live because that's my lifeline. So these kids learned all kinds of aspects from math, science, social studies, how cities work, how parks work. I mean, it was a great learning. And then they, they, built, they built and delivered uh, these solutions. Very exciting. What was interesting about this, of course, they were given th the rope, so to speak, to, to come up with ideas. Yes. To, and their, their teacher was very encouraging of that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it, it's uh, empowering students to take advantage of all the, you know, all, basically all the world's information is available anywhere, anytime online. So in the context of learning, this is less about trying to teach kids what's in a book and see if they can remember it and put it back. Because the, the, the value of being able to repeat an answer versus look up an answer. That's one of the things that's changing. And so what you really need is not the answer. You need to understand the question and you need to, uh, you need to know how to ask the right question as opposed to give the right answer. And that's a, a real flip of how education is gonna change because anybody can, anybody can find an answer to anything. Not everybody can come up with the right question. We are running out of time, but I just wanted to get into, get into this. Two years from now, will you have more proposals in terms of innovation in government? 
Oh, ab absolutely we will, and, uh, but, but some of those we don't need legislative action. We can get going right now uh, with, our, with our cabinet uh, meeting. We're going to be heading into an off-site planning session soon, working on a strategic plan for the state, working on, on uh, cross-cutting initiatives that cut across all of these agencies. Because, well, we, we budgeted as a state, almost 50 different budgets get approved through appropriations. But if you take a category like kids under age 6, Kids under age six show up in about 20 different budgets. And so we need to think about how do, how do we optimize for audiences and for groups and for solutions. I mean, if you take a look at addiction, you know, how many different budgets does that touch? Uh, so, so that's where we're going we're to be taking a look at, a, say, in these cross-cutting initiatives, and we'll, we'll pick some, we'll drive them forward. And if we, if we can't solve them just with the executive authority we have, then it'll turn into legislation, and we'll seek the legislative approval to, to keep pursuing, pursuing solutions. Great, and we'll have to talk about this two years from now. Great, all right. all right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. Our guest today on Legislative Review, Governor Doug Burgum. And this is our last Legislative Review of this session. For Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us.